June 8th, 2000. I grew up with this sense that I was saved for a reason. I, I should do something about it. What she has done is inspire a generation. I think that she's, she's amazing. She was saying how we should reach out to our generation. She's like, swept me on my feet. I was like, whoa. To ask questions. What happened? You know, how did you make it through the jungle? I want to know why, why they did that, you know? And to remember. You must remember how they live, not just how they died. Because when you remember how they live, they get to live in every single one of you. Tonight, a survivor's story, living to tell. From ABC News, this is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Sometimes the horror that a person experiences is so great that it becomes almost impossible for him ever to broach the subject again later in life. One of the extraordinary consequences of the film Saving Private Ryan, which began with the searing sequence of U.S. troops landing on Omaha Beach during the Normandy invasion, one of the consequences of that movie was that it made it possible for a number of World War II veterans to begin talking to their families about what had happened to them more than 55 years ago. A great many Vietnam veterans have also found it difficult to share with their families the experiences they suspect only other veterans of that war can understand. There are in this country today tens of thousands of young Cambodian Americans with little or no idea of what their parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles endured during the early and mid-70s after the Khmer Rouge, the Cambodian communists, took control of that country. They don't know because their elders find it almost impossible to speak of the unspeakable. It has fallen to one of the younger survivors, a young woman by the name of Luang Ung, to act as a bridge between generations and cultures, but most of all between then, there, and now, here. Cambodia was a prison. We didn't have walls, but it was a prison. We were compelled, we were so compelled, we felt inspired to do something. 1.52 million Cambodians were killed of a population of seven million Cambodians. She really provided oh us with that confidence that we probably wouldn't have had in ourselves. It's never been a forgotten war for me. It's never been a sideshow war. She ignited a fire in us, and it started chain reaction. I think we're gonna pass out the candles to the audience. Cambodian-American students at the University of Washington are preparing a candlelight vigil we put it all the way down there. to make sure the world doesn't forget that 25 years ago the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia and slaughtered up to two million people. <laughs> Every one of these young people has been affected by that reign of terror and has lost a parent, grandparent, sister or brother. Is it gonna hold us down? Some were born in the jungles as their parents fled for their lives. So there's no, there's no life, just my mom screaming in pain and, and while they're doing all that, I mean, I was born. Others were born in squalid refugee camps. My mom was pregnant with me all the way um, on her escape to the Thai border. Most people from our generation do not know much about what happened during Paul Pot's years, and plus our parents aren't open to talk about it. It was so painful to them that they don't even think about it. And I always want to know about it. And she doesn't like it because she's away from there now, you know, and I guess she wants me to move on. <laughs> The Hollywood movie, The Killing Fields, is how many Americans learned about Cambodia's terror. It was the same for a lot of the students organizing the vigil. It's in the movie, but it's so real, surreal that, uh, I don't know, I, didn't, I don't want to watch it again. And it was just brutal, you know, and then when I talked to my aunt again, she was like, it was, it was even worse than that. What they have never heard are details from someone who actually lived it. It is my honor to introduce to you, Ms. Luang Ung. 
It was this 30-year-old woman's story that moved a generation. On this exact day, 25 years ago, I was five years old. I was five years old. And you can remember when you were five. I was... Father, I, I grew up in a big family with um, both my parents, three sisters and three brothers. Um, my father was a politician. So small in stature, he was a man with a big heart. My mother was 5'7", um, and so she was considered a bit of an Amazon for the Cambodian culture and uh, very beautiful. My brother were all very stylish. They wore bell-bottom pants, and um, they tried to grow Elvis sideburns, but was pitiful because they could only grow thin ones. Um, we listened to Santana's all the time. We listened to the Beatles. Our lifestyle was, was privileged. We, um, we lived in a house that had that was equipped with modern amenities. In our house, we had flushing toilets. We had um, helpers, maid servants, whatever you want to call it, to come in and do the chores for us. And yet my life, as I knew it, ended on this exact day, April 17, 1975. I was on the sidewalk with my sister and, and a friend playing hopscotch. And all of a sudden, I heard this roar coming in from just the back of us. And it got louder and louder, and it was just rumbling. I didn't know what it was. And then, and before I even saw the Khmer Rouge trucks, there were people that all came out of their shops and their houses, and they came and stood in the streets. At first, people thought the Khmer Rouge were their saviors and that the war was over. But on all the trucks were these soldiers, and they stood body to body, very close. And they all had black shirt on and black pants on, and on their backs there were guns that sort of slung, and, 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 and on their belts there were grenades that hung like ornaments. Next thing I know, um, when I went back to my, my apartment again, everybody was packing. My, my mother was throwing all the canned food we had into bags. My brothers and sister were trying to take what little clothes they had and putting into bags. My brothers were going out and getting our trucks and, and putting everything into the trucks. When we got onto the streets, I can see that the soldiers were out there with their bullhorns screaming that we had to get out, that we had to leave and to leave as little things and to pack as little things as we can to sustain us for three days. And they said that the, the Americans were going to bomb, the Americans were going to bomb. If we leave for three days after that, it, it took them three days to clean the city, then we can come back. Phnom Penh, a city of more than two million people, was evacuated within days. And from the top of my truck, I could see all the black heads, and I just thought that we looked like ants. We didn't know where we went. We just went along and moved with the mass, inch by inch. The journey ended in the countryside along with everyone else from the cities. So began a new agrarian society, erasing everything from the past, even the calendar. This was year zero. They believed that they had to ban religion. They had to ban, uh, they abolish money, um, ban schools. Um, music was abolished. You couldn't have any kind of music. Any kind of things that would give a human being or would, would provoke and, and, and would inspire a human being to have individual thoughts, to be an individual, were banned. That included newspaper, radios, um, televisions, um, gatherings and meetings. They went as far as making people wearing haircuts. Girl had to have the same crop style haircuts. Although in this agrarian society most of the population was involved in back-breaking work in the fields all day, the food never found its way to the ordinary people, and very soon, hunger was the norm. And then as we got hungry, your body would at first disappear, it became malnourished, the flesh would disappear from your, your limbs, and so that it be more skin and bones. And then when it go through that stage, after it disappeared, your stomach would grow. And I would th look at myself and think, if I pop my stomach, it'll burst like a balloon. I was six years old. We would work. And when my father come back at home, it would be so late. And um, he would be so tired. And his body was so initiated 
started when when I could get close to his body. It wasn't my father's body anymore. I couldn't sit on his lap because it would hurt him. Because my bones and his bones would grind on each other. And I couldn't sit on his lap. This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by Sears. Smart. It's the magic word during Kenmore Days, our exclusive Kenmore appliance event. Start with 0% financing till January 2001 on all Kenmore appliances over $3.99. And then on any Kenmore washer, dryer, or refrigerator over $3.99, get free delivery, too. Kenmore Days, only at Sears. Smart. Stylish. Simple. In a word, Kenmore. America's best-selling appliance brand. Sears. The good life at a great price. Guaranteed. Sometimes you have trouble sleeping because you can't stop thinking about the tensions of the day. Try new Aluna Sleep. It's not a drug. Aluna promotes a natural sleep pattern in just a few nights. New Aluna. It doesn't make you sleep. It lets you sleep. If you want help maintaining healthy joints, the makers of Tylenol proudly introduce a Flexa. A Flexa contains glucosamine, which can help promote flexibility. Try it for a month. A Flexa. Do what moves you. Friday. It's everywhere. Soy milk, soy hot dogs, soy turkey. Everybody's jumping on the soy bandwagon. I like the milk. But is a high soy diet for everyone? Is there a downside to this low-fat wonder? 2020 investigates Friday. Why is the Plano Rug Gallery going out of business? Due to personal and financial reasons, I'm closing Plano Rug Gallery. Are the rugs the same high quality the Plano Rug Gallery is known for? Absolutely. We have rugs from India, China, Pakistan, antique Persians, fine masterpieces. Everything is included in this going out of business sale. Are you discounting all these high quality rugs? Yes, everything has been drastically reduced. So hurry into the Plano Rug Gallery, 19,009 Preston Road between Frankfurt and Lloyd. Volunteers, we all have regular jobs. We can be coming from anywhere. We get a call, we need to get to the fire right now. Things that are going through our mind are hazards we might face so that when we get on scene, we're ready to act. We need a truck that can uh, handle anything we throw at it. Four full-size doors gets us in and out quickly. There's six people in the cab, and there's a ton of room for cargo. Great truck. One of the main goals of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge was to rid Cambodia of all intellectuals, professionals, and people who had worked for the previous government. That, of course, included Luang Ung's father. The family had tried for months to keep their background secret. I, I don't remember what time it was, but the soldiers came and with their guns, and they came and they asked my father. And they said that they needed my father to go and help them remove an ox cart that was stuck in the mud. My father said that he needed to talk to my mother, and she ta they talked to each other in the hut, and then he, he left, and my mother was just crying in the hut. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand. I see my father going off to work all the time, every day. Um, and then I saw my father sort of stand up straight and held his shoulders straight and squared and he told the soldier he was ready to go. I went over to him and I tucked at his pants and I said, um, can I come with you? And he said, no, he said he has to go. And then he surprised me, picked me off the ground and, um, and, and held me really tight. And I could still remember just my feet dangling off the ground, my arms around his neck and my face resting on the neck of his neck and smelling his body odor and he just held me he just held me he put me down and went over and held my brothers and sister and picked each and every one of us up and then he said he was ready to go and the soldiers left with him and, and we just watched the whole time and us his figure got smaller and smaller and smaller until it disappeared 
That was the last time Luang saw her father. Her mother soon realized that the Khmer Rouge would go after the rest of the family. Three months later, my mother gathered all my siblings around, all of the young siblings, and said we had to leave her. And I didn't understand it. I didn't know what she meant. And she said that we had to leave. We had to um, separate. She said that we stay together, we would die together. She said that we couldn't even go off together, that I was to walk north, my sister was to go south, my brother was to go east or west in whatever directions we go. And we were to walk and walk and walk until we get to an orphanage camp. And then on, the, on that morning, she, she packed our little belongings, our, fish, our, our food bowls and our spoons, and we, into our grandma, and we tied her around us. And us, I was climbing down the steps of the stairs. I reached out for my mother's my mother's hand and she swatted my hands around and then she turned me around by my shoulders me screaming I don't want to go I don't want to go I want to stay and she turned me around by my shoulders pushed me out the door and hit me on the on the bottom and said get out I don't want you and so instead of being so angry and being so sad I became very angry I, I hated my mother for doing that it was her act it was her sacrifice not her weakness was her incredible strength and courage and sacrifice that saved me, that allowed me to be here today. At the orphanage camp, Luang was soon singled out for her feistiness and strength, and she was transferred to a camp for child soldiers training to fight the Vietnamese, who were engaged in continuous skirmishes with the Cambodians. Instead of working in the field every day, which we still did, we would have half a day of being trained, of being trained physically with arms and guns and knives and how to protect ourselves. And they're going to be half my body's height and a third of my body's weight, and I'm taught to shoot it. A sickle, a hoe, a knife, an axe, a hammer, sticks. And we were taught to look at everything else around us and to see them as weapons so that when the Vietnamese soldiers or other enemies come in and try to hurt us, we would be able to defend ourselves. It never came to that, not at least for Luang Ung. The Vietnamese army had completely overrun Cambodia by 1979, and during the chaos of the invasion, a nine-year-old girl on the run did not attract a great deal of attention. How she made it across heavily mined territory, across the border, into Thailand, to a refugee camp, is a story for another day. Luang had lost her father, her mother, her older sister, and her baby sister. They were all dead. She miraculously was alive, and within a year, she would come to America. I see her the same time almost every day. She's always there waiting for me, you know? <laughs> You can set your watch by her. Look, she's a real sweetheart, you know? I mean, I bring her lunch up to her farm and I sing Italian love songs to her. In cities across the country, Philip Morris provides grants to Meals on Wheels programs to eliminate waiting lists so that thousands of additional seniors can have a hot meal and a visitor. I'm the only person she sees most days. And if I could just get a spot on her face, well, it's the high point of my day. Philip Morris and Meals on Wheels are fighting more than just hunger among the elderly. We're fighting loneliness. Dive, love, <laughs> Working to make a difference. The people of Philip Morris. Problem? The doctor says my cholesterol is still too high. What about diet and exercise? They didn't do enough. So? He suggested adding Lipitor. Lipitor, the number one prescribed medication for lowering cholesterol. In clinical studies, Lipitor with diet was proven to lower bad cholesterol 39 to 60 percent. Total cholesterol 29 to 45 percent. Triglycerides 19 to 37 percent. He said over 4 million people have started taking Lipitor to lower their cholesterol. Lipitor is not for everyone, including people with liver disease or possible liver problems, women who are nursing, pregnant, or may become pregnant. There will be blood tests to check for liver problems. Tell your doctor about muscle pain or weakness, as these may be signs of serious side effects. You take Lipitor once a day. Ask your doctor or pharmacist for more information on Lipitor and call 1-888-LIPITOR.
Well? Lipitor did it. My cholesterol's way down. Lipitor, the lower numbers you're looking for. Blame America. America causes cancer. We've always said that in Canada. <laughs> That's taught in Canadian school. Politically incorrect, coming up. I want you to repeat after me. I will not eat food made by a clown. I do not want a playground in my dining area. I want to eat at Schlotsky's because I am a grown-up. Schlotsky's, funny name, serious sandwich. Come closer, closer still. Now, lick the screen. I can't believe you just licked the screen. That is the power of Schlotsky's. Funny name, serious sandwich, and pizza. In the beginning, I, I, I felt a lot of guilt about, about being alive. Um, I felt a lot of guilt about leaving Cambodia. I felt a lot of guilt about being here. And yet, I survived. There were so many times where I should have been dead. And so I grew up with this sense that I was saved for a reason. I, I should do something about it. Luang has written a memoir of her life that has deeply affected young Cambodian Americans. It takes you there. I feel like I'm watching you in a movie. Yeah, it was really vivid and powerful. Having this book has a voice for us Cambodians. The war I didn't study was the Khmer Rouge War. And it's the same thing with my nieces and all these other Cambodians. They study all this history and the history they know the least is Cambodian history. Can you talk about it? Have you talked about it? With her book and her outreach, she is helping them sort through their history. Because I want to be connected more to Cambodia understand the hardships that everybody went through. I'm trying to put these pieces together that he gives me, but yeah, I hope that one day they'll all come together. Luang sees it as a generational as well as an emotional issue for older people. It's still very painful. It's painful for me to talk about it. I can't talk about it without tears, and I talk about it a lot. It's very painful. It's very hard. And I think there's a lot of reason there's the language barrier. The Cambodian generation, the new generation, are more fluent in English. Um, they've also never been to Cambodia. A lot of them haven't been to Cambodia. So they don't know the questions to ask. Why do you want to know your history? If I don't know my history, I don't know myself. My parents always been open to it, but they don't really initiate the conversation. We have to ask them questions. We have to start the conversation. And, uh, you know, I thank you for it. And a lot of Cambodian students have come up to me and said, thank you. Thank you for doing this, because your book, in a way, has given me permission to ask questions. When the Khmerites took over, I was about three months old. The vigil they organized was a chance to share experiences. They gave up everything for my freedom. I lost both of my grandparents. I had seen a lot of people were killed. As well as eight of my aunts and uncles. She had to step on dead bodies. All I wanted to do was just cry. So that they wouldn't have to step on the, the landmines. It was a forum, you know, for, for people to get out there and tell their story. And I kind of allowed them to let it out. and It was, gave them an outlet. I lost the precious person of my life in that killing field. That's my wife. And in this exploration of their history, these young Americans have a new appreciation of their parents. To know that they went through this, it makes me think of them differently, look at them in a different light, to appreciate what they've gone through, and to know that, you know, my life here is, is very privileged. I'm lucky to be here in America. I'm, all my parents went through, I mean, they, they came here and they survived the war, where some people, some families, they don't have anybody. A free education, we have three meals a day, it seems like we have it easy. I feel like I have the good life. I never felt starvation. I feel like I'm just a spoiled kid. And it has helped them identify their Cambodian side. Cambodia is your heart. America might be your home, but Cambodia will always be a part of your soul. I feel like it's okay to be myself and that it's okay to actually be Cambodian and it's okay to actually celebrate the fact that my parents were able to survive such an ordeal. To have that 
knowledge of your family it's it's fulfillment in life it's it's a requirement it's 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 a necessity it's like you need to know your family's past in order to to know yourself i have one foot in cambodia i have one foot in america i'm a child of many cultures and i think for the, a lot of the students that's who they are also and 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 it's i think it's wonderful for them to see not only an asian face and to hear the story not only from journalists and politicians and soldiers but to hear the story from someone who went through it and yet someone who's adapted and who's doing well in america i'm very proud to know that they say that i inspire them i'm very very happy to know and, and to hear that they say i inspire them I'll be back in a moment with a word about how you can chat online with Long Un. Okay, so I'm not on the new golden dollar coin. That's cool with me. I've got places to go and I've got people to meet. Anyway, the new coin is perfectly all right without me. In fact, I use it everywhere. Thanks. So, money. Introducing the new golden dollar is changing the face of money. Besides, I still look good on paper. Channel 8's Family First Fridays at the Mesquite Championship Rodeo is a good deal for you. When you clip a coupon in the Dallas Morning News Friday Guide, you get general admission or reserve grandstand tickets for only $8. It's such a good deal because we're not the only ones who put family first. You've got kids to think about, kids who want to go to the rodeo, and you don't want to pay a lot, so you don't have to. Log on to WFAA.com or call 972-222-BULL for details. Now that's the spirit of Texas. Canadian-style price controls on America's prescription medicines? Ask Canadians. They say their health system is in crisis. Government price controls there interfere with doctors and patients, and bureaucrats switch too many seniors to older, cheaper, less effective medicines. Some Canadian cancer patients are even bused to the U.S. Call Congress. Don't let Canadian-style price controls cost you your medicines. You can join an online chat with Luang Ung tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Just click onto the Nightline page at abcnews.com. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good. Nightline is always on with abcnews.com part of the GO Network. You can order a transcript or video cassette of this or any other Nightline broadcast by dialing 1-800-CALL-ABC or visiting abcnewsstore.com on the World Wide Web. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. The stars have their backs against the wall, and the Devils are just one win from the championship. The series returns to Big D as they battle for the ultimate goal, the Stanley Cup.
New Jersey versus Dallas Game 6. Saturday night at 8, 5 Pacific on ABC.